Hi, my name is Jessica Click. My mom came to know the Lord uh, through a Billy Graham crusade. We were at church every time the doors were open, um, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. But I can remember a turning point one night is when my I came downstairs and my father wasn't home and he was in a, a fight um, and he got thrown in jail. And so through that it came out that um, my father had had a drinking problem and that he was a drug addict. I started just questioning everything. This is what Christianity is. This is what Christians do. You know, I, I started to question God and looked for love in all the wrong places. So that led to a string of relationships that were based purely on the physical. I happened to get a job at a place where uh, a young man named Tim Click was working and started out just hanging out. The relationship was, was a good friendship. Um, it quickly moved to a physical relationship. Two months after uh, we started dating, I found out that I was pregnant. We did decide together that we would seek to have an abortion. I remember that drive the first time. I can tell you all of the details. I remember in, inside that something literally and figuratively died in me that day. Um, there was just a part of me that I knew I could never get back. Tim and I are still dating, but I was pretty sure that I deserved for him to leave me um, because I thought that I was a monster. We did remain together. He actually proposed and, and we were engaged uh, November of that year. In April of the following year, um, two months before our wedding, I found out that I was indeed pregnant again. This time I just made the appointment without even thinking. I don't remember anything about the second time. Um, I feel like that's probably the lowest point. Feeling that God wanted nothing to do with me, uh, that I was never going to be used for anything valuable. I'll give you a minute on Jessica's story. Just let, let her sink in for a minute. Obviously, in her story, there's a major trigger word in there. Abortion. Very controversial topic, even political. Let me wear the referee stripes today and just say, listen, that's, that's not where we're going. So don't get ahead of me. I want you to give Jessica the respect of knowing that all she did was share her story. This is her story. This is what she went through. So let's, let's keep it on that. She made a decision. She made a choice. Under a lot of weight and a lot of pressure, she made a decision. Maybe somebody here Maybe somebody joining us online, maybe you can relate directly to the choice that she made. The truth of it, though, is that all of us, all of us can relate. She, she made some choice or some decision that she had no idea that when she made it, how she could project how it was going to affect her life later. What it would do to her inside, in her mind, the way she saw herself, even the way that she thought God saw her. She had no idea. All of us know what it's like to make a choice, to make a decision, for there to be a consequence, and for us maybe even to wish that we hadn't made the choice. That if we could, we'd go back and we'd change it. That's called regret. That's one of the things that come along with the decision making. We just might regret a choice that we made. There's something called instant regret. If you go online right now and you look up instant regret, you'll see a video of a guy wearing nothing but shorts jump off the hood of his car onto a cactus. I'm telling you the truth, instant regret. Or, or try to jump off the roof of a garage and time a truck riding by to land in the bed of it, miss it, square on his tailbone, instant regret. If you've ever been in a juggling text frenzy between this conversation and this conversation and like maybe a group text and one with your spouse and then not knowing where you're at, you send the one specifically for your spouse into the group text, instant regret. 
Like, baby, don't forget the prunes on your way home. Something like that. Instant regret. We heal from them fast. The same way that they're instant, we heal from them. Maybe it's physical. Maybe just embarrassed. Nah, that's not the ones I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ones that you can't foresee, that when you make the choice, you have no idea that you're going to maybe wish that you hadn't done it later. There's seeds that we plant in time, and then we go away with our life, and then we come back, and there's some massive tree there that we had no idea would come from it. It's like, it's like a story I heard once about a, about a man who was selling his house. It was a man selling his house, and where's my homeowners? Where's my proud homeowner? Wave your hand. Be proud of that. Wave your hands. Proud of homeowners. There was a man selling his house, and the one who wanted to buy was a poor man. So he, he begged and he pleaded with the homeowner, listen, I can't afford your house, I'm poor, but I really, really want it. Can I please buy your house? So he pleads with him, and the owner says, okay, I'll give it to you for half the price. Homeowners, don't get mad at me. Just imagine, half your mortgage, gone. He says, I'll give it to you for half the price on one stipulation. One stipulation. I get to keep ownership of one little nail, one nail, just one, one little nail above the doorway of the house. Sounds like a good deal. You can get me, knock half off of a mortgage, you can have two nails, bro. I'm fine with that. Seems like nothing. So time goes on, and the old homeowner, he looks and he sees how well the new homeowner's doing. Man, he's got new landscaping and took off the old looking shutters and did something else and it's looking good. It's the feeling that you get when you give away clothes to somebody and then you see them in it and they look better in than you and you like, it was a loan. That's what he was experiencing. So he goes back to the current homeowner and he says, hey, I wanna buy my house back. Well, of course, this is his home. This is, so what would you say? No. No, I, I bought this house. This is my house. This is where I'm at. I'm not selling it back to you. When he refused, the old homeowner went out, found the carcass of a dead dog, came back and hung it on the nail that he owned. That's my nail. Don't touch it. Imagine the horror, the, the disgust that he couldn't, the, the current homeowner couldn't do anything about it because the old homeowner owns that now and could do anything he wants with it. So before too long, it, it became unlivable. The current homeowner had to now be forced out and move on. That's what our choices do. We think that maybe in that moment, and maybe there was some circumstance that caused you to make the choice. Think about that one who wanted to buy the house. He was poor. Please, I'm, I'm, I'm pressured by my poverty. There's a reason why I have to ask you for this, and there's a reason why I got to settle for this little nail stipulation. We think, and when we make a decision or a choice, it's just some little nail in time. Until one day, the owner of that choice comes back looking for what's theirs, your life. And when you don't want it to come back looking for you, to rise back up and give you a name or give you a label that you don't want nobody to know about, that old decision, it won't go away easy. It's going to go find something dead and hang it right over your front door. For everybody to ride by and see you and judge you and say, look, look at there, look at that house, look at that cheater. Look at that addict. Look at that quitter. Look at that one who got divorced. Look at that girl who chose an abortion. And so what we do in that moment is we either own it, that's right, that's who I am, deal with it, this is who I'm ever going to be. Or, like that homeowner, we're forced to move, maybe literally, maybe we got to leave town quit our job, drop all our social media accounts, change our number again. Oh, <laughs> and you sure ain't going back to church.
We're forced to live two, two different lives as two different people. There's the person that we want to show people that we are. But deep inside, the person that we believe we are is the one that made the mistakes or the one that has all the weaknesses and the struggles. It's like Eminem said years ago, I am whatever you say I am. If I wasn't, then why would you say I am? If I'm not my mistakes, if I'm not my weaknesses, if I'm not my struggles, then why do I feel the shame of them? Why do I carry the weight of them? Why do I wish they would go away? It must be who I am. And then we settle. We might even believe all the things we believe we hear in church, that God loves me no matter what, all true. But what we really live by is knowing like this is, but this is who I am. This is all I've been taught, it's all I've ever known, it's all I've ever struggled with, this is all I'm ever gonna be. That's it, deal with it. There's a story about 16 blocks. It's a story about Detective Jack Mosley and a low-life, petty criminal named Eddie. And one day, Detective Jack Mosley gets the assignment that he has to transport Eddie 16 blocks, the title, 16 blocks across town to testify in court. Now, along the way, this turns in from a simple transportation ride to a fight for their life. Because along the way, everybody from hired thugs and hitmen to even police are coming after Eddie's life. And it's because the testimony that he's carrying will indict and bring down a corruption ring within the police department. So they're fighting for their life, and also along the way, Detective Jack Mosley, he has to, he has to war within himself about why he's risking his life for this no good criminal. There's a scene in there where, as you know, Eddie's kind of like a motor mouth. He runs his mouth in the most awkward times and says the most awkward things or random things. Are you that person? You know. So he does that, and in one of his conversations, he says to him, he says, you know what, Detective Jack Mosey, he says, I'm going to change. I got a plan. I'm moving to Seattle with my sister. We're going we're gonna to start a, a bakery. I like to bake cakes. He says, I'm going to change. This is what Jack Mosey says back to him. He says, you know what, times change, seasons change, but not people. People don't change. See, what hasn't been revealed yet is Jack Mosley is struggling with the fact that he's one of the officers that will be brought down. Maybe you kind of feel or can relate to Eddie. Matter of fact, we all can. On God's scale, we all can. We've all failed. We've all broken his law. And maybe... Maybe you, you have this sense inside you that change is coming for you, but life keeps telling you that people don't change. A fact to, as a, an actual caveat to that story, a fact is like 44% of people who leave jail go back. Maybe life is telling you that. Maybe every job you've tried to get afterwards is telling you no and it's saying no, people don't change. Or it's telling you about somebody that you're praying for. Somebody that you just desperately want to see the change in their life. And life is telling you, mm, it's fall, seasons change, times change, leaders change, things change. But not people. Not people. And imagine if you're, you're Eddie, imagine that your crime it's something like murder. See, we looked last week at a guy named Saul in the Bible, and he was just that. He was a murderer. If you know Jesus today, like in, in 2018, be glad it happened in 2018 and not in his time because he was the Terminator. He was literally killing people 
because he was trying to stop this whole thing of this Jesus movement, of people believing that there's a God who loves them and that his son would come and give their life for him and, and die and resurrect so that they can have new life. He was trying to shut that down. And he thought, he thought that what he was doing was right. And so one day he's on one of his killing spree journeys. He's headed to a place called Damascus. He's riding in his car and all of a sudden there's a, there's a, X-Files moment where this bright light shines and looks like he's about to be abducted and he gets knocked down off of his ride and he hears a voice. This is where I want to pick up today. This is Acts chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. He hits the ground and he says, who, who are you, Lord? And Saul asked, I'm Jesus. I'm the one who you are persecuting, he replied. Now watch the second half. Watch the second half. Now, get up and go into the city. Go where you were going. I want you to go where you were going. Go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Here, here's what I, I like in this story. Anybody ever get in your business and tell you you shouldn't be a certain way? And you're automatically like, you're right. Why did Paul comply? Why, why, I'm sorry, why did Saul comply? Why did he listen? I'm sure there were people in his life that were like, are you sure, like, mass murder is like the route you want to go? You know, like, I'm, I'm sure there were people who may have questioned his reasoning or why or whatever, but I'm sure he just shut him down. Like, nah, this is who I am. This is my mission. This is what I'm supposed to do. But why at that moment in the scripture could he not argue. How come he just complied? Because the following verses say he got up. He couldn't see. He was blind, literally blinded by the light. He could not. He didn't have his vision. So the guys who were with him had to help him up. But they took him. They took him to where Jesus told him to go. How come he complied? Why didn't he argue? It's because of who he was talking to. You can't argue with Jesus. When it's God, you can't when it's God, you can't argue it. You might want to say out of your mouth that it's not. You might tell people that it's not. You might turn and go the other direction. But in your heart, you know when it's God, you can't argue with it. See, I think, I think Detective Jack Mosley is right. Times change, seasons change, but people don't. Think about, I'm serious, think about yourself or think about somebody that you just wish would change and the life they've lived their entire life and you just, they ain't going to change. I think he's right. People don't change. People don't change. But God changes people. God changes people. <laughs> Paul had made a choice. So, I'm sorry, I'm giving away the plot. Man, Spence... Saul had made a choice. I'll get there. He changes his name. All right. I'm spoiling a movie anyway, too, so whatever. And you had plenty of time to watch it. It's a great movie. Okay, listen. <laughs> Saul made a choice. He made a choice that affected his life. He made a choice that took him down a path. Jessica. She made a choice. She made a decision. She made one that she thought had disqualified her from being used by or even loved by God. We've made choices. We're going to continue to make choices. And we make choices that sometimes will place us in a setback that keeps us from being who we want to be. But the same way today, here's the deep breath in the message. The same way that a bright light shined and hit Saul and sent him on a different path, I pray shines today and gives somebody the encouragement, the belief of this point right here. And it's that the setbacks of our choices are just a setup for change. If God changes people, then the setbacks of our choices are just a setup for change. I'll fast forward now. I'll fast forward. Saul has his life changed by God. He has his life changed by God. And to show that, he changes his name from Saul to Paul. I'm not Puff Daddy no more, I'm Pete Diddy. He changes it to show the... T 
twice. I did not think that was going to work that well. <laughs> God, you're good. <laughs> he changes his name because he wants to show the world that knew him that he's different. Time out, I want to take a commercial real quick. I'm going to come to a moment in this message where I ask everyone a question. And then right after that, I'm going to give you a challenge. But that's showing that there's been a change in your life. You know what that is in the church world? Yell it out if you know. Yell at, somebody yell it out. What's, what's, that, what's that public display that you've changed, that God's changed you? What is it? Baptism. It's coming up. Night of worship. I don't care if you said yes to Jesus when you were six like I did. or Whether you just did it six minutes ago. Sign up. Be baptized. Paul wanted to show, he wanted to show the world that God's done something different in me. And then he, he makes this change, and he goes on to be the one who writes a big chunk of the Bible from being the one who tried to destroy it to, to writing it. And he, he planted churches, and he wrote letters to churches. And he, this is one of the verses that he wrote. This is like one of the first verses I can remember memorizing as a kid. And I'm so glad. I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, you read this last part to yourself, or say it, say it out, come on, the new is here. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. This is the feeling of new sneakers. Shout out to my baby, she picked them out, I'm wearing new sneakers right now. You know a new sneaker feeling? Michael Jordan used to put, he would put on a pair of new Jordans every game because he wanted that feeling of new kicks. This is new sneaks. This is stepping over the ones that stepped in doo-doo a long time ago or maybe even yesterday. I have needed, the, this is the beauty of this verse. If you're sitting in here and you think that this is good for somebody who's got one of those past, oh my God, the horror. Like if, if you think this verse only applies to them, no. This is a daily and hourly verse. I have needed this verse so many times to speak over my own life, to pray it over my own life when I have said the stupidest stuff at the worst times. I'm like, God, Please let me just rewind. Give me a DeLorean. Let me go back. Let me take that moment back. I, and, and, and this verse says you don't need to go back. You don't need to go back and correct it. You don't need to stay in a setback because that's a setup for something new. This verse is a new 24. You take a shot at life and you miss and it hits the rim. God has your rebound and he has a new 24 shot clock for you. It has a new day for you, new 24 hours. Listen, it's, it's not just for the person who needs to get past their past. It's the person who tomorrow morning after you send your kids off to school, your kids are going to hate you because of the way you were or the way you treated them. You know what this verse says? They can come home to a new one in the afternoon. It's hourly. It's daily. It's whenever you need it. Do you, do you know, do you know what the greatest button on a video game console is? The reset. <laughs> Chose the wrong path, got the consequences. Oh my God, will you please? Fresh start. Fresh start. Does anybody believe this today? Does anybody believe this today? Now. Now, there's two key letters in this verse, and it's if. This is available to anyone, anywhere, in any condition of their life, regardless of how big or how small. This is available to you if. If, it says, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in church, no, no, you guys are online. You're probably at home because you're prepping for the game. I ain't mad at you. <laughs> but it doesn't say if anyone be in church. It doesn't say if anyone be in life group. It doesn't say if anyone be in charity work. It doesn't say if anyone be fill in the blank. It says if anyone be in Christ, what does that mean? 
in 16 blocks, in 16 blocks, there's this moment where Jack and Eddie are pinned down. Now the entire police force is coming after them because the, the corruption has like made it look like they're felons. They realize there's no way out of this, so Jack tells Eddie, look, just, just go. Get to the courthouse. Go testify. Eddie goes. Jack realizes this is probably where his life is going to end. He's going to go down fighting the police and being in a shootout. Eddie comes back. He comes back to him. Remember I told you he's just awkward. He just says random things. He comes back, not like, hey, I'm here to help. He comes back and he goes, Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry went to jail and he changed. He says, Barry White. I didn't even know Barry White went to jail. He said, Barry White went to jail and he changed. I can change. I can change. Motivational speech, they get out of this situation, right? They, make, they get to the courthouse, but Jack Mosley says this, Eddie, go get on a bus. Get out of here. Go. Sends him off. And then Jack Mosley, knowing, knowing that it would indict himself, says, I'll take the stand and testify on Eddie's behalf if you expunge his record. That is if anyone be in Christ. Jesus took the stand of the cross for our criminal record. Whether literally or figuratively, he said, I will do it. And it's not, it's not his own indictment, it was ours. And he said, I'll take it. God, if you forget their record, if you wipe it clean, I'll go into their mess. I'll go into their mess if you wipe it clean. For a new start. To to bake a cake in Seattle, I, I'll do it for them. Listen, I normally do this at the end of a message. We're going to do it right now. If you're here today, if you're watching online, and you want to receive that, the gift that Jesus has expunged your record now and forever, and that you can have an eternity with him, and that you can have new life right now. All it takes is a yes to believing that. And I'm going to ask you in this room, I'm going to ask you online, do you want that? And if you want it, and if you've never said it before, now's your moment. If you want that, you can say it quietly to yourself. You can tell the person beside you. You can sign it. Shout out to our signing, you guys. Give, give her a... If you want that today, right now, say yes, and God hears you. Say yes. The cool thing about the end of that story is that one day it's Jack's birthday. He's done his time. He was a cop, so I'm sure he barely made it out of there. Anyway. But... He's done his time, and he's at like a restaurant with some friends and family. He's having a birthday, and they bring in his cake. He blows all the candles out on the cake, and this is what it says on the cake. Chuck Berry. Berry White. Jack Mosley. People can change. God changes people. So what's the icing on the cake for us? Can, can, can a terrorist become a church planner? Can a founding gang member become nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize? Can the girl who chose an abortion ever be anything but that? Only Jessica can answer that. Let's hear the rest of her story. We remained together uh, three years into our marriage, I found out that I was pregnant again, and of course, everything's set up right, we're married, it's fine. Eight months after Ian was born, I was pregnant again. Isaac is our second son, and he was born early, and I thought, well, this is it, this is God, he's going to take this baby, and, and I deserve that. He was fine, he spent nine days at the NICU, uh, and he was fine. So it was about when they were three years old, my husband and I decided that they we should take the kids to church. It just so happens that the first Sunday back, there was a couple standing on the platform and she went on to share and her testimony was, she grew up in church, she knew all the right answers, 
turned her back on the Lord and had two abortions. So she talked about over the years, she thought that she was fine, but she had gone through a forgiven and set free Bible study and she now knew that she was free. And there was something inside of me that, that was craving that. I, I wanted to be free, but I didn't think I could be forgiven. So I sought her out after the service to see where I could get this freedom and forgiveness. And she had spoken of this forgiven and set free Bible study. One Sunday morning, there was a pastor that had come to the church and he started to share the gospel. He said, somebody here needs to hear the gospel. So on October 7th, 2007, that gospel was shared for me. I asked the Lord to forgive me for all that I had done, that I had made such a mess of my life. And I asked, asked him to be in charge. I never wished or thought that a part of my life would, would involve abortion, but I know that God has used that, whether it's there at the pregnancy center counseling young girls who are seeking abortion or sharing a testimony in a church or a youth group just to have people come up and say, you know what, I'm hiding this sin, I'm struggling with this sin. And, and it's through that that God has shown off, um, that He's shown His glory, that nothing's too big that He can't forgive. And I know that through that, Tim and I came to Christ. Um, and I'd like to believe that one day I'll be able to hold my children in heaven. If you or someone here today is struggling with the thought of, of having an abortion, or maybe you have had an abortion, please know that there are people here in this church, there's people in the area who want to help you. There is a God who forgives. And there is a way out. You don't have to live with the scars and the pain any longer. Um, there is not anything too big that God can't forgive. The ground is definitely level at the foot of the cross. Thank you, Jessica, so much. This is what's cool about her story. Where's all my nerds at? Be proud. Be proud of that. Be proud of that, Valor Victorian. Where's all my nerds at? Put them up. Jessica's story is a great illustration. I love, I say that because I love when I see science just prove God. Like we're all mad at science. Science, science is cool. God made it. Like I love when I see it explain God and believe it or not Jessica's story is a great illustration of something in science Newton's third law of motion this is where you've probably seen it illustrated at Newton's third law of motion says that for every action you know it there's an equal or where's my nerd, my nerd shouting you out today for every action there's an equal or opposite reaction not only does God forgive us for maybe choices we made that were against him, like, like Saul, he was actually fighting against God. Not only does God forgive us of that. Remember, remember Saul was headed to Damascus, right? And when Jesus met him, he didn't say go somewhere else. He said, keep going on that path. He was just gonna give him something different. Not only did Jessica on the setback end realize that she could be forgiven for something she believed was sin in her heart, that she could be forgiven for that, but that there was an equal and opposite reaction from God that went from someone who made that choice to becoming a mother, he's not done, he's not done, from, from making the decision to becoming a mother to now serving at a place where she helps girls battling the same decision. Only a God can do that. And he can do it in yours. Listen, only, only, man, only God could take the very guy who said, Jesus, like, like kill him. Like, only, only God could take that guy and use him to place you where you're sitting at right now in a church. Only God could take a founding gang member like, like Stanley Williams. And, and meet him in his jail cell to a place where when he found Jesus, he dedicated his life to battling the very thing he started, gang life, to the point where he was recognized by the president and nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Is there a God? Is there a God? Yes. And you know whose side he's on? The person with a setback. Now what happens? In the science world, when that one sphere swings out and gets set back, and then it crashes into the other ones, there's all kinds of, this is where I get, I can't. This is where I, we talk to one of your nerds when they raise their hand. They'll be like, oh, like, there's this transferring of power and it shifts into the other ones and sends the other one flying out the end, the exact proportional, right, you know, whatever. What happens for us is, is this. Let me show you another verse. 
This is what happens in that interaction for us. In Acts chapter 9, verse 17, it says, this is a little bit of the story. I'm going to rewind back. Before Paul had got to Damascus, before it saw, this before, you know, the Paul train, this is, I'm rewinding. It says, then Ananias, Ananias was somebody that Jesus also spoke to and said, I want you to go here because Paul, Saul's going to need you. When Jessica went to church that day, she saw an Ananias, somebody selling, telling their story. You might be somebody's Ananias, somebody who needs to hear you speak into their life and tell them that there's, there's a, a comeback for them. Maybe you're, maybe you're receiving yours today from somebody, but, but he, he, he met, he said that Ananias went to the house and, and when he entered there, he placed his hands on Saul and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me. God will place people in your life. Don't, don't fight it. You know who they are. You'll see it. You'll know it. What, what, Paul couldn't deny when it was God. You'll know. He sent me so that you may see again. Remember, he was blind and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The moment any of you said yes this morning, you got this right here. God's presence entered your life. You were sealed by him. He says the moment, and again, filled with the Holy Spirit, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. That's gross. I picture like a lizard, like Something from, something from Saul's eyes, like scales, fell from his eyes, and he could see again. He got up, and he was, what? Show it, y'all. You say yes this weekend, next weekend, you better be in the water. You better show him what God has done. Listen, this is what happened. The scales fell. He could see again. It was this point right here. We'll see change when we change how we see. We'll see the change in our life when we change how we see. One more verse, one more verse and we're done. This is just an example of like what we, what we need to see when God has come into our life. When we've said yes to Jesus, when we've asked for that forgiveness, when he's expunged our record, and now we wanna believe that God changes people. Says, but the Holy Spirit that's in you, that you've received, when you, when you receive that gift from Jesus, the Holy Spirit that's in you, produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Let's just pick one. Let's just say, let's just say all you've ever known is maybe hate as a defense mechanism or culturally it was taught to you that it's okay to hate a certain kind of person. You receive Jesus, he's gonna meet you on the road and he's gonna say no, no love. It's changing. It may take some shift. It may take some powerful seeing. It may take a long time for those scales to fall, but he's going to knock them off. And when you begin to see things different, you will see the change in your life. Remember this. I'm going to close with this. The the neat thing about that Newton, I don't even know what that thing's called. Spheres swinging. The neat thing about that is that it keeps going. I don't want to discourage anybody by saying, oh, you get through one setback, you're going through another. But that, that's life. You just might. You may have already be looked back on on one setback, but there could be another one coming. That's why, that's why if anyone's in Christ, it's a daily verse. Remember that. But maybe, maybe you're in a setback right now. Well, there's one coming. Don't be afraid. Don't feel like you have to go back to seeing the things you saw before, looking at them the way you did before. Remember that an arrow, you can only fly. Hit your target. Be who you're supposed to be until you first been set back. Let go. Let go. Receive Jesus today. Claim 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If I'm in Jesus, brand new. Take them new kicks out the box. You got a new 24. And you'll see the change when you change how you see. I want to give you a moment to just be alone with God. Take a moment. Close your eyes. This is where you pray. This is where you talk to God. This is where you say, God, I want to be new. I don't want to live with regret in the decision that I made. I don't want it to have power no more. I want to be new. Take a moment. 
And you say that to God whoever you're going to say that. We hope that you have enjoyed today's experience. We also hope that this message has challenged you and will encourage you in the upcoming week. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ today, congratulations, welcome to the family, and welcome home. One of the most important first steps that you can take is by letting us know. You can click the prayer tab or you can visit us at lifehousechurch.org. And if this message or ministry has blessed you in any way, feel free to partner with us financially. You can click on the Give tab or you can visit our website and click Give. We are so thankful that you joined us and we are thankful that you are part of our extended family. We can't wait to see you back here next week.